Beyond Ayodhya, India's Looming Crisis of Demography Jihad Written by Rakesh Krishnan Simha India is exuberant after the historic Pran Pratishtha of the Ram Temple in Ayodhya on January 22, 2024. For most Hindus, it is an iconic moment in their history as this is the first time in centuries that a Hindu temple destroyed by Islamic invaders has been reclaimed and rebuilt. Across the nation, there is an air of optimism and a belief that Hindu civilization is set to attain new heights. There is every right to be confident about the future because the Ram Temple has unified Hindus in an unprecedented manner. But this collective national excitement needs to be tempered with a reality check about the primary challenge staring Hindus in the face, demography. On a modern historical timescale, it doesn't take long for a country with a substantial Muslim minority to be taken over by Islam. This isn't rocket science, it's the combined effect of population and time, Muslims outbreed their hosts by having more children. According to Pew Research, between 2015 and 2060, the global Muslim population is set to increase by 70%. In contrast, Christians will grow by 34%, Hindus by 27%, and Jews by just 15%. Muslims, regardless of their economic status, tend to have more children than other groups. This demographic trend is attributed to the Quranic diktats to take over the world. For instance, the Quranic verse of the sword is used by Islamic scholars to proclaim a universal and permanent jihad against all non-Muslims. In such a situation, over several decades, the Muslim minority overtakes the host and becomes the new majority. The process can never be reversed because once a country passes into Islam's digestive tract, it can no longer switch back to democratic rule. Secular Lebanon was known as the Paris of the Middle East, but it became the most dangerous place on earth as soon as the Muslims became the majority. The takeaway for India is that a rapidly growing Muslim minority should never be taken lightly. Indeed, India looks like an excellent candidate to become the next Lebanon for the following reasons. A rapidly growing mass of more than 250 million Muslims are attracted by the myth of pan-Islamism. Certain Muslim groups are initiating deadly riots over trivial matters across the country at all too frequent intervals. Significant numbers of the Hindu majority are still oblivious to the looming threat of an Islamic takeover. This is despite ample evidence of Kashmiri Muslims expelling the tiny Hindu minority in India's only Muslim-majority state. Losing control of your country Before looking at the civil war starting in India, it's worth exploring how Lebanon got there first. Lebanon is the historic home of the Phoenicians, the legendary ancient traders whose maritime culture flourished there for over 2,000 years. The modern democratic state of Lebanon was established in 1920 by the French as a homeland for Lebanese Christians following the genocide of 40% of the country's Christian population by Turkey during World War I, 1914-1918. At the time, Lebanese Christians comprised up to 75% of the country, the rest being Muslims. By the 1932 census, the Muslim share of the population had skyrocketed from 25% to 45%. This massive demographic change in just 12 years was entirely due to Muslim couples having up to 10 children. The Christians, at 55%, still had political control, but the slender majority wasn't going to last. While Lebanon was still a secular democracy, it was the playground of the Arab world, with its famous nightclubs being the envy of Europe. Its financial power and stability through the 1950s and 1960s earned it the name of Switzerland of the East, while its capital, Beirut, attracted so many tourists that it was known as the Paris of the Middle East. Like India, Lebanon was multicultural, with as many as 18 religious groups, all coexisting peacefully. It was an open and multilingual society, with almost everyone speaking French alongside Arabic. It was the most prosperous country in the region after Israel. By the 1970s, the Muslims had crossed the halfway mark. Their numbers were further bolstered by displaced Palestinians. Just like Indian Muslims are enthusiastically welcoming illegal Rohingya immigrants, the Lebanese Muslims forced the government in Beirut to allow the Palestinians to settle in the country. 
The Christians woke up too late to see their country swamped with Muslims who were now demanding more seats in parliament and the presidency, which by law was reserved for Christians. The result was a civil war, and the end of the road for Lebanon. If you grew up in the 1980s, the evening news almost always had a clip of a bomb explosion in Beirut. The Palestine Liberation Organization, the notorious terrorist outfit founded by Yasser Arafat, took over the country, and Beirut became a mini Stalingrad. It is estimated that 600,000 to 900,000 citizens, nearly all Christian, fled the country during the initial years of the civil war, which started in 1975. The Christian exodus further boosted the percentage of Muslims in the country. As much as 7% of the population was killed during the civil war between 1975 and 1990. For all practical purposes, Lebanon is a dysfunctional entity, a country in name only. Sleepwalking to a disaster. Lebanon offers a glimpse into what India faces as the Muslim population grows unchecked. Like the Lebanese Christians, the Hindus of India may discover their fate sealed only when it is too late. First up, Hindus must not forget that Pakistan was created as the homeland for all Indian Muslims. The Muslims of undivided India had voted to create Pakistan. So, how come there are more Muslims in India than in Pakistan? Indian Muslims belong to two large schools, the Delbundi and the Barelvi. In July 1946, the Muslim League won all but five Muslim seats. This makes it clear that all Muslims wanted to create Pakistan and take India back to the Mughal times. The Barelvi group pursued the Medina strategy, create a beachhead called Pakistan to come back to Delhi and reconquer India. The Delbundi strategy was to stay on in India and convert it from within. The truth of the above is illustrated by the relentless population growth of Muslims and a corresponding decline of the Hindu, Sikh, and Jain populations. Census year Hindus plus Sikhs plus Jains, percent Muslims, percent Christians and others, percent. 951 86.459.83.8 2182.813.43.8 2011 81.514.24.3 2050 EST 76.718.44.9 At first glance, these figures may not seem alarming, in fact, they may even appear reassuring, until you project the growth rate of Muslims into the 22nd century. And while projecting far into the future is highly unscientific as there are way too many variables, there is one variable that doesn't vary, the mindset of the Indian Muslim. Demography is destiny. In March 2020, a Kerala Muslim couple had their 13th child. The woman, Sharifa, is only 33 and delivered her first child at 18. Her husband Hanifa said children are a blessing of Allah, and the couple will continue to produce children till their health permits. It's not just poor Muslims who are outbreeding their Hindu neighbors, even the well-to-do ones are in favor of having as many children as possible. This is because the Muslim community in India understands that demography is destiny. They know democracy is a numbers game. In my first job as a journalist, I had a colleague, Babar, name changed, who belonged to an upper-middle-class family from Uttar Pradesh. Babar was basically a Pakistani in everything but citizenship. He not only had family members who had migrated to Pakistan in 1947, but he would also boast how the Pakistani missiles Hath, meaning death, in Arabic, and Ghaznavi in Gauri, named after brutal Islamic invaders from Afghanistan, would devastate India, if Hindus dared to attack Muslims. I will never forget what he told me the day Atal Bihari Vajpayee was sworn in as Prime Minister in May 1996, you can finally have your Hindu PM, but we are ready. Our plan is to have as many children as possible to increase the Muslim population to such a level that even if you tried to kill us all using your state machinery and resources, you wouldn't succeed. If you didn't know this radical side of Babar, you'd easily label him a secular person. He was educated in a good school in Delhi, lived in a nearly 100% Hindu neighborhood, had Hindu friends, did not fast during Ramzan, did not pray, or no visible Muslim symbols, and spoke everyday Delhi Hindi. 
But far from being secular, he was a proponent of population jihad to outbreed Hindus. Worse, he refused to acknowledge a democratically elected prime minister as his leader because Vajpayee spoke for Hindus. This ghettoized mentality of the Indian Muslim is a mortal threat to India's freewheeling democracy. Their collective desire to overtake Hindus, seize power, and re-establish the Mughal Empire, the wet dream of every jihadi in the Indian subcontinent, could eventually plunge the country into civil war. Preparing for Mayhem The Bengaluru riots of August 2020, coming just six months after the highly coordinated Delhi riots, point to the increasing sophistication of the jihadis. In earlier decades, nearly all riots were sparked by an incendiary speech by a mosque preacher, resulting in hundreds of Muslims going berserk post-prayers. It was like a fire spreading out of control until the paramilitary arrived and restored order. The brunt of the violence was always borne by innocent Hindus who were caught completely unprepared. In some cases where Hindus were organized, as in Mumbai under the Shiv Sena, there would often be a ferocious backlash, but this was rare. The Delhi and Bengaluru riots revealed a new side of religious violence against Hindus, that the Muslims were preparing for riots before the spark. This is taking things to a new level of mayhem. Firstly, no community should resort to violence as it disturbs the peace of the entire country. If you want to burn down your own country, then it reveals a lot about you, primarily that you are anti-national. But preparing for riots in advance by stocking acid and firebomb hurling catapults for a future clash is a disturbing new trend. The other takeaway from Bengaluru is the guerrilla-style tactics being used by Muslims. The secular media can no longer deny the high level of coordination among Muslim mobs who locked up cops in two police stations, torched police vehicles, and tried to prevent reinforcements from rescuing their colleagues at the two stations by blocking roads with burning vehicles and firing a barrage of stones, bricks, bottles, and other objects at every step. A fire truck was attacked, and its occupants were nearly lynched by the rioters. When a country turns into a war zone because communities are clashing, that's civil war. A magisterial report into the pogrom unleashed on innocent Hindus concluded that Islamists were behaving like a terrorist gang. Another worrying trend is the increasing radicalization of Muslim police officers. According to the National Investigation Agency, at least 873 officers of the Kerala police have links with the now-banned Popular Front of India PFI. These included sub-inspectors and station head officers. The primary charge against them is that they leaked information, including the moves of the state police to the PFI. Police officers have been terminated from service for leaking details of Hindu activists to the PFI. Illusion of Safety Before the partition of India in 1947, non-Muslims were either a majority or a substantial minority in the cities of the areas that today constitute Pakistan. Lahore's 240,000 Hindus and Sikhs constituted about a third of the city's population in 1947, today, Lahore is almost 100% Muslim. Again, as per the 1931 census of India, all the five major cities of Sindh were Hindu majority, today, Hindus are around 1%. In Karachi alone, the Hindu population decreased from 51% in 1947 to only 2% in 1951. The Hindus and Sikhs who lived in these cities did not realize the danger they faced until the very last hour when frenzied Muslim mobs landed up outside their neighborhoods, ready to burn, loot, rape, and expel them. Almost a million Hindus and Sikhs were slaughtered by the Muslims. Most of them had to leave behind their extensive lands, businesses, homes, and much of their wealth. This was repeated in Kashmir in 1990 when the Hindu pundits were expelled. It happened yet again in 2016 in Karana, Uttar Pradesh, arguably India's Hindu heartland. Closing Remarks If India's political and military leadership ignores the relentless invasion of the Hindu space by Muslims, the stage is set for a future civil war. The only way to stop this is by imposing president's rule across India for several decades. Such a move will be celebrated by the overwhelming majority of Indians, including Muslims, who will also be free to continue with their lives without being instigated by the left and liberals to bait Hindus.
The central rule has worked brilliantly in Jammu and Kashmir, which has been transformed from India's number one terror-affected state to a state of near normalcy, with billions of investment rupees and millions of tourists now pouring in. As many as 90% of Kashmiris say they are satisfied with the state of affairs. And this was India's most separatist and radicalized state. The only groups that will oppose central rule will be the jihadis, and their secular and leftist Hindu friends, who will find their breaking India plan scuppered.